Tony Stubblebein co-founded Lyft on the idea that positive reinforcement and community support are things that help people actually achieve their goals. Before he founded Lyft, he was the CEO of Crowdvine Event Social Networks, which built social software to help people connect and meet. I'm kind of interested in having him on the podcast today because, well, when you look at what happens with social networks and you look at what happens with positive reinforcement and just building a community, you can actually cause change in human beings much more efficiently. And I'm kind of just in impressed and interested in what happens when you take those ideas and you put them into a company. So I invited Tony to be onto the show. And Tony, welcome. Well, yeah. Hey, thanks for having me. Good idea. <laughs> I, think will, I think this will be fun. Actually, I saw you on stage, you know, maybe at like the Quantified Self conference last year. Does that sound right? Yeah, I was at Quantified Self talking about sex, I think. That's right. It stood out. And... Um, and, so to speak. Yeah. That's probably a really good pun I could have made there. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I didn't get a chance to meet him, so I, I, I'm happy that we finally get a chance to, to connect. Yeah, I'll be swinging by your offices one of these days when I'm back down in the Bay Area, but I'm taking this one from my biohacking ground zero facility here. Rad. All right. All right. So what's Lyft? Tell me about it. Yeah, I mean... Just like you said in the bio, we got really interested in what does it take for people to be superhuman. And any research you do, like basically anyone that you've ever heard of that you think of as a genius, it turns out they had incredible support along the way that you never hear about and that uh, that is the secret to their genius. Like, why, why was Mozart a music prodigy? Because his dad was a frickin' uh, music teacher right? Like those things help, right? Why is Tiger Woods so great at golf? Like why was he a prodigy? His dad is one of the greatest uh, coaches of child golfers probably the world has ever seen, right? And so, you know, we just looked into this, I mean, initially just for ourselves, like, hey, you know, what, what system could we put in place that would make us better? And just even in my own experiments, I think the thing that got me onto Lyft is I built a little motivational tool for myself that quantifiably doubled my productivity in a day. And I thought, oh, that's good. I mean, some people take drugs for this. All I had to do was write a little bit of software. So, But what if you wrote software and took drugs? Wouldn't you have written the software in half the time? Yeah, I know. It's 4X. I think my investors... <laughs> When they, when they hear this podcast, they're going to be pissed that I'm not also doing drugs on their behalf. Um, the, so anyway, so Lyft for now in its current arc in, incarnation is, uh, is an app. You can use it on the web. You can use it on the iPhone. And it provides a, a couple of basic pieces of support that should work for whatever your goal is. Is it productivity? Is it a better relationship? Is it control of your own... Uh, you know, kind of troubles is that health, fitness, all of those things work inside of Lyft. And the the fundamentals of support are you, know, you can't you can't change what you don't measure. And a lot of times, what you really want as you get going is some sort of information sharing from people that uh, are doing it with you. So everything in Lyft is backed by a community of people doing the exact uh, the exact same thing as you. Well, let's talk for a minute about what you, you do yourself for productivity. You're kind of a programming badass. You're an author of uh, Regular Expression Pocket Reference by O'Reilly. So like, if, if you're listening to this and you're a software developer, you're probably like on your knees doing you know, proper levels of worship for a coding god. Is that kind of right? Well, well I, <laughs> you know, it's funny, right? It's like there was a period where that's all I aspired to be. And now um, I almost always write the first version of the software in a company that I found and then real coding gods come in and take over. Um, yeah, I'm curious, what are your, what your productivity ha tips are? And, and like, I'm happy to share mine. It's like everyone has a system that's a little bit customized to them, but there's usually some, like, some overlap. Like what, what's your focus when you're thinking about your own productivity? Right now, energy management is, is front and foremost. I also am kind of obsessed with decision-making fatigue because yes. as a CEO and just I have this incredible pressure 
from people that I genuinely want to help. Like, like if someone sends me an email who I don't know at two in the morning, I honestly want to help them because I'm like, if I spend five minutes, I can save this guy like $20,000 in lab tests and like five years of suffering. And it's a really good investment of five minutes of my time, which means I have to find five minutes of time if I want to do that. So how do I make decision making move out of my head? How do I empower others? Yeah. But not lose control and, you know, turn into you know, the next Monsanto where, you know, like the company does all sorts of bad stuff. And I sit at the top, either blissfully unaware and evil. Since I'm not evil, I would be just blissfully unaware. So I don't want that to happen either. So where does all that go? You know, you're, you're CEO. Like, what do you do? Yeah, I'm super focused on my morning right now. Like, so I took that like same research on decision fatigue. And the way I internalized it is I was like, I have a decision budget every day. There's only a certain amount of decisions. Yep. And the thing about that decision fatigue is it doesn't actually differentiate between big decisions and small decisions. It's just there's a certain number that you're basically able to, you know, get through in the day and you know, you can juke it a little bit with a little like when and how you eat, but basically you're spending it down throughout the whole day. And the morning is where you set yourself up for whether or not you're efficiently spending your budget or inefficiently. Like, you know, kind of my standard default, if I was not um, on top of myself, would be that I would wake up uh, based on an alarm on my phone. I would immediately check my email, my Twitter, my Facebook, and then every other social site that I might have recently gotten uh, likes on. And... Um, and then my head would be filled with about 50,000 different things to do. And then every following step would be a negotiation with myself between which of those 50,000 things should I do. And those are all decisions and they wear down your, your decision budget. So my whole thing is get to a clear head as soon as possible. Uh, meditation is a big part of that. But the other one is, a, is to get, um, get my to-do list out of my head and on paper as soon as possible. And the top thing that I learned recently, which I actually I learned it from one of our investors, Evan Williams. He um, he blocks out his whole calendar, which like that's a good idea. And for a long time, I didn't do that. But you know, if if I have a to do list of ten items and then I, you know, I block out my day, I see well maybe I'm only going to get to three or four of these because I have a bunch of meetings. Um, and that, that's basically what keeps me from, from just wearing myself out with a bunch of you know, useless decisions. It, it's kind of funny. Deciding which of the 10 things to do can itself be a burden. And yeah. I, I come across that a lot just in, in my own thing because I have, I've practiced getting things done for a long time, for instance. And I found out no matter what I do, I can file and categorize every single thing that comes into my inbox and it still comes in the work still has to get done. And after three years of pretty dedicated practice, I stopped doing it because I realized that the decision of where to file something was costing me more than the potential fear of not having something done. Right. Yeah. I'm, lo I'm looking for a better framework for how to do the prioritization. I mean, right now I just, I asked myself this question, which of these things will actually change the outcome of the company? Like that's the, the thing I'm constantly on the lookout for is what could I do here that today would change, like really significantly change the company? And it turns out if, you, if you're really critical of most of the things on your to-do list, almost nothing changed. Like I have to get back to our accountants to make sure our taxes get filed. Okay. I mean, that'll happen, but it's not going to change whether or not we're a successful company. Yeah. Um, I'm recruiting today. That absolutely is in the category of it would change if we find the right person. And so once I'm clear on that, then a lot of the other stuff goes away. And so it's actually pretty easy, since recruiting is so important for me, it was actually pretty easy for me, at least today, to let almost everything else drop, drop away. Yeah, getting the right team put together is, is so critically important. Now, now, what do you do, though? I didn't think we'd actually go here on this, but all right, so let's say getting your personal taxes filed. Not strategic, but it's kind of important because it's annoying when you get phone calls from the IRS asking you for money that you wouldn't have had to give them otherwise. Yeah. Right? Okay, so if, if that's the situation, 
how do you make sure that gets done? I mean, do you have a system for that? Um, yeah, I mean, it gets done. So I think the, <laughs> the system is, you know, those things, I think, wait, um, tend to wait. Um, I think there's a little bit about those things, though. The characteristic of them is that the quality of how you do them doesn't matter. Like, at, if Lyft were, was a bigger company, um, it would really matter, right? But if I were to do my taxes today, I would have all of this extra time to look into all these edge case tax credits that really aren't actually for us, but because I have all the extra time and I gave myself all this time, then I would, it would just take longer than it would need to. And I think there's actually some value to procrastinating on less important things because you work more efficiently when you have actual urgency around them and it helps time box it so that you know, the scope of work isn't uh, as big. Speaking of boxes, you're working in a building. Is there a window you can close? Because I'm hearing all kinds of like jackhammers, construction. Uh, you're definitely a startup. That, that is too bad. Nothing um, we can do. That's cool. I, mean, I'm, I just know when people are in cars and they're listening, they're always Twittering me saying, Dave, your audio quality is no good. So I have this like Death Star microphone. If you're watching this on YouTube, you can see I literally have the, mic the microphone to end all microphones. You know, it's funny. We, you know, my first startup, I actually worked for a podcasting startup called Odeo, and it's famous because it's what Twitter spun out of. And, and it was right at the beginning of podcasting. So there was always this big debate about uh, audio quality. And definitely a lot of audio files gravitated to podcasting, and they hear every one of uh, these audio imperfections. Yeah, my windows are closed, and but we were in downtown San Francisco, and yeah. apparently, there at least you're hearing jackhammers and not this guy that's yelling on the street. Oh, we so just a screamer down downstairs that um, he's louder than the jackhammers. I, I was at 16th and Mission for a while, a few years back uh, when I was CTO at Basis, the wristband kind of company here. Um, but today, but yeah, it was it was crazy stuff. Uh, you, you just unbelievable. So yeah, in, in cities, sorry everyone listening, you're gonna hear that sort of thing. But I right, let let's get back to the value of procrastination. You were just talking about this. This is kind of cool because most people never get to hear a couple of CEOs and like successful serial entrepreneurs talk yeah. about this kind of thing. And it, it's kind of personal. You're like, well, you know, am I a weak CEO because like I, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't pay attention to something? Right. Um. Yeah. I'm really. I feel like I'm really lucky to have worked with different types of people who were successful. So kind of your standard stereotypical CEO is amazingly intense and look, I mean, they're just going to like, they're, somehow it seems like they're going to get everything done because they can't help themselves, they're so intense. And um, I'm actually, I'm lucky at Odeo, I, I worked with Evan Williams, who's now one of our investors and basically co-designed Lyft with us. And he founded Blogger, he founded Twitter, he founded um, now Medium is his current project mm -hmm. and just a really really thoughtful guy and the best bio I ever um, read about him one of the phrases was uh, you can hear him thinking and I just thought well that's exactly right he never yells at you but you can hear him at his desk quietly typing up some some like well reasoned mission statement that you know explains the whole future of the company and once you read that you'll be able to get your work done without him ever having to yell at you. Nice. And, and um, you know, a lot of, a lot of my, um, I mean, I just, he, I relate more to him. I think when you're taking advice, you have to take advice from someone who's actually like you. And uh, so, you know, I see the way he runs it. He really tries to keep focused on the things that matter. And, um, and he's really good at it and really successful. So you try to emulate the people uh, around you who've been really uber successful at that. So. Well, you've also done a ton of research, and this is one of the reasons that, that I'm really interested in this, because you've looked at, at habit research specifically. And I mean, what did you learn from the habit research that's different than what you learned from you know, being a CEO or from Evan Williams and people like that? Were there obvious holes or were there obvious commonalities? Like, like what came out of it all? Yeah. They, you know, it... It's so funny to talk about habits in terms of CEOs or you know managers at all, right? Because 
the you know when someone is doing habit design with you, I, like I did, I did a lot of my um, a lot of my education came from a Stanford professor, B.J. Fogg. Oh yeah, who's, you know, super well respected in the space. It's like one of the first names you're going to hear, and um, his default uh, example when he's going to teach you about habit design is he starts talking about flossing, and he says, you know. Like uh, start with something small and let it grow, and hit a lot of his concepts are around tiny habits. Um, but when you're a, when you're a CEO, a lot of your habits are decision making habits. When someone asks you for something, what do you do? When uh, when you feel like when you have an uncomfortable feeling in your gut, how do you react to that? And those are basically habitual and the more that you can um, be clear with yourself the easy, just the easier it is and so a lot of my life as a CEO is trying to figure out the things that I just 100% believe kind of what are my philosophies and then recognizing if something comes up that fits one of those philosophies and then I don't have to negotiate an answer, right? Like, I guess when we talk about decision fatigue or your decision making budget, the it, those get worn down every time you have to negotiate. And if you just already know, well, this is these this is my belief system, then you have almost a canned response for a lot of these things. So when I look at um, Ev, I think you know one of the things he has is canned responses for saying no. I mean, this is a guy people ask him for money, they ask him for time, they ask him to speak. They ask him for jobs, and he just—he's really good at saying no to all of the things that he would never do, right? Or that are kind of borderline, and and somehow he's put that infrastructure in place where he's able to say yes to you know a handful of things every you know every year that actually matter. Yeah, so saying no as a habit is something you don't hear. I, I guess we have to have the no habit is the title yeah. of a book. Someone get that domain real quick. Hashtag coming. Right. <laughs> I don't. Do you find like, like, um, sort of emotional control is kind of one of the challenges of being a CEO? Control, that, control of my own emotions. Yeah. Until I did forty years of Zen and heart rate variability training, it was an issue. But as it is, when there's emotion it's usually something that I intentionally bring in to help underline something, but I'm not actually, hey, if you work for me, don't listen to this. And I'm actually not that mad because like, I don't, I don't allow my nervous system to do that to me because it costs me a lot. If, I, if I'm sitting there fuming and I'm angry at my people, it, it's far more powerful if you're level-headed and you say, look, this situation really disappointed me. I'm unhappy with the results. I don't like where we're going. Yeah. Right. It's it's nothing to say. You son of a bitch! I can't believe you did that. Like one right. of those is an emotional response. The other one is expressing justified disappointment, but still supportive of the team. And and I th I find one motivates people to yeah. to do better, not like themselves, but you know to to bring their values out all the way. You know to to be inspirational. I hope versus yeah. the other, which isn't. Sometimes emotion is just part of communication. Yeah. Like if they're expecting you to be emotional and you're not it just ends up being confusing but yeah. I, I really remember when I first started when I first started my first company what you said about kind of sitting there fuming and you know I kind of made this mistake of using my actual cell number like all over the site so we would get there's a constant stream of phone calls from people who just basically wanted to waste my time and you know I think probably all of your listeners have gotten at least you know several dozen calls from a telemarketer and you know, at an inopportune time, and the telemarketer is pretty rude, and they've maybe tried to argue with the telemarketer, right? And um, yeah, you know, I would get so many variations of this that you know, like sometimes there's a telemarketer is like trying to sell me aluminum siding, but recruiters, um, uh, associates of VC firms, people that want <laughs> to be, you know, associates of VC firms are basically telemarketers. Have you ever gotten a call from one of them? I, I've been an entrepreneur in residence at a venture capital firm, which, which is not an associate. Yeah, it, it's a it's a rough gig. It, it, I mean, it's actually it's so ridiculous because what they tell you is, um, you know, I'd like to talk to you to see about starting a relationship, and you know, with the idea that we might fund you in the future. 
But anyone that knows anything about venture capital knows that you'll never get funded by a venture capitalist unless someone that they know outside of the firm makes that introduction on your behalf. Like you're not going to just have a sweet talk some associate into getting investment. So it's a complete waste of time. They're lying to your face because what are they really doing? Just market research? Quite, quite often it's market research. Yeah. I mean, I, I think as a CEO, the best thing you do when an associate calls is, is you just send them all of your spreadsheets. You know, of, of course, they're not actually like the right spreadsheets. I'm just kidding. Right. Don't yeah. be mean to VCs. You never know when that associate will be a partner later. And also, they're all people. And yeah. most of yeah. the associates I know are working their asses off for not that good of pay. And yeah. like, like they're, you have to be hardcore to make associate at a good VC. So like, you know, it, it, it's a thankless job. And it sure as hell better than selling aluminum siding. But I, t to your point, yeah. If it's a cold call from an associate, you know, not a partner or an introduction from someone you know, who's worked with them before and maybe, you know, been a, a, a success for that VC, your odds go down so dramatically. Yeah. Well, it's it's worse. The worst for me is always the recruiter because they really don't. They're just going to try and find some way to, you know, get a conversation going with you. And they're pretty rude about it. And so, I, you know, I used to kind of hang up in a huff. And then I would like we would have we'd be done talking, but I'd be sitting there a little bit annoyed with them for like so the call might last thirty seconds, but might take me out of my zone for half an hour, which is super yep. costly. And so the thing that I did was, and I wrote a blog post about this, and it's still one of my favorite posts, is I just wrote down a script for every single type of person that called me, and that involved me being polite but hanging up. And the script would be. Oh, thank you so much for calling, but we're not interested right now. Goodbye, pause, have a nice day, click. And so, and I, I would just, if they said goodbye as well during the pause, great. If they didn't, at least the last thing I would hear is myself being polite to them and then hanging up. And um, but just by having a script, I like, I was then able to remove this um, kind of this emotional part of my day and. I mean, that's the that's, I guess when you when you hear kind of the super the hero worship around entrepreneurs, I don't think you get how um, they're not. I mean, everyone is like tripped up by something, and yeah. it's always distracting, and you have to have your little strategies for getting around it. It's interesting. I used to to spend an inordinate amount of time of like, how'd you get my number? Like, who are you? Where do you live? And I in fact, when I was about, I don't know, 26 or 27 uh, and much angrier, someone called me like that and I got their number so I could call them back. And I called them back every day and I pitched them like on Amway and on Herbal Tea. And, and I just would not let it get off the road. I must have spent an hour doing this, right? Yeah. And and it was it was actually mean. And like I'm sure at, at the other end, they're like, oh my God, I can't get this guy off the phone. Like, what's going on? This is so annoying. And he calls back and he pitches the same thing again, right? <laughs> And it, part of me is like, oh, I got my revenge. But knowing what I know now about like my inner wiring, like I don't think um, what was that Indian proverb? You know, feed the wolf that you want to win. Like I, I don't know that I made the world a better place. I don't know that I made myself a better person by doing that. Um, so what I do now with stuff like that, if they get through, and I have systems in place where it, basically, if, if the call isn't scheduled with me ahead of time, and you're not on my very short list of like close friends and family kind of thing. I'm probably not gonna answer the phone. And even if you're on my list, the odds of my time being scheduled then so I'm not answering are almost 100%. So it's like, you'll learn to call my assistant or to email her and say, when could I possibly talk to Dave? I know it might be 8, 17 p.m. tonight because that's his first available. And then that is what it is, right? Um, I was hanging out at some kind of founder gathering and the, the CEO I was talking to got a call. And he, um, when he looked at who was calling, he turned the phone around uh, and showed it to me with this big smile on his face. And the contact said, do not answer. And what he'd been doing for years <laughs> is, anytime he got a call from someone he didn't like, he just added it to this one contact, do not answer. <laughs> so I've been doing that too, and I like that. It, I get a big kick out of it when I get a do not answer call. That is so brilliant. And this is an example of why when you call someone, if you're listening to this, uh, you should have a reason for calling, have an agenda, not waste their time, not waste your time. Uh, one of the things that just drives me nuts is, is every now and then someone will get through and, and like, oh, I just wanted this to be our initial call, like to just kind of set up a relationship. And I'm like, 
maybe you have a different amount of time pressure than I do, but I set aside a half hour to talk to you because you got past my my BS detectors. But if there was no reason for us to talk and you don't know why you're calling me other than like you thought I was cool, like I respect that. I'm grateful you think I'm cool and all, but like seriously, like yeah. like get a plan and I'm probably not going to talk to you again. And, and that's right. It's something to be aware of that honestly, I find especially younger people when they first enter the workforce, no one's taught you this in school. It, right. it, it, you're not going to know it. But don't burn bridges by calling people without an agenda. But, you know, on the flip side, if you have younger audi- audience members, like, shit, you're allowed to make so many mistakes at that age. Okay. It's unbelievable. And that's the thing I learned in starting my first company. Like, I didn't know how to do anything. And, in fact, I did everything wrong. Yeah. And it was really slow about figuring out how to do it right. And, you know, it really just didn't matter. <laughs> like, there's so much opportunity in the world and, you know, if you're driven, if you like what you do, you'll eventually figure it out. So I like, I, I don't like to think too hard about what I was like in that first year. Uh-huh. The ridiculous situations I was creating um, just because of my own uh, ignorance. There's a, there's a group, 20 Under 20, uh, that Peter Thiel funds, which is a group of you know, young entrepreneurs uh, who are under 20 years old, who have been paid not to go to school to instead start companies. And I, I'm a mentor to the program. And so I, I get to go, get on the phone with these guys on occasion and like kind of know the organization structure. And it's kind of funny because honestly, if you're 18 and you're going to go to Sand Hill Road, like you're going to get run over by a 750 uh, IL. It, it's, it's like, it's going to happen, but the VCs are all there too. And so you do get an amazing number of passes, but like someone needs to tell to tell you when you're 18, don't chew gum in a meeting. And yes, we know Zuckerberg wore you know Adidas flip flops and a hoodie, but maybe you can do a little better than that. Like at least make sure it's a nice hoodie or that doesn't have like naked pictures on it or something. Like like there's just a certain level, and as you get older and more experienced, you get that. But it, it's kind of funny because we all start out with kind of a blank slate, unless you know your dad is John Doerr or something, and you know, and you you have you know the the VC in the blood. But not all of us have that, right? All right, so you learned something about the habit of saying no, which is, which is itself kind of amazing and something that most people could work on uh, more. And there's a whole set of, of psychological stuff that happens oftentimes before you even have a chance to think about whether you want to say no or not. Like, in fact, we've seen some research using uh, very detailed physiological monitoring that says you can basically predict whether the person's going to say yes or no before they think of the answer consciously. Really? Like your body knows a yes or a no before you do. That's interesting. It's Wait, it's kind of scary. To the degree that, like, is that something that you could spot? Is that a tell? There are tells you can spot, but I don't believe those are ones you could spot without a whole lot of physiological monitoring, unless you're one of those, quote, intuitive people. Because one of the fields that we put out that we're just learning more about is there's a, a donut-shaped electromagnetic field that sits, it's tilted, I think, eight degrees to the left or 18 degrees, I forget. So it kind of sits here and we can detect it about this far out from the body. And the scary thing is we know if you walk into a stall with a horse, your heart rate variability and the horse's heart rate variability will synchronize. Basically yours won't change, but the horses will change if it's a trained horse, right? And this is why scared people make crappy riders because the horse can tell you're scared, but we don't know what the mechanism is. And there's people who say maybe it's electromagnetic, but it's not touch based. So you walk in, the horse changes to match you. Like, it's spooky. What, yeah. What's up with that? But maybe that is a tell, and maybe we're wired to sense that. But if we are, you probably don't know you're wired to sense that. But yeah. maybe we could train you to be. And that's, you know, that's amazing stuff, but it's pretty far out there. I think, um, I think one of the most um, effective hobbies that I ever picked up that ended up mattering for business was poker. And I am positive... Like, if I think someone's lying to me, I'm positive that I know. You know, just based on, like, having played a lot of poker with people, you kind of pick up, like, yeah, the, there's a bluff going on here. And so every now and then I'll just be out in the world and someone will, like, I, will lie to me and I'll be like, and sometimes it won't even matter, but I'll just be positive. Like, hey, what? Wait, why Why are you bothering to lie to me right here? Um, but it is, there is this kind of intuitive sense and, like, you kind of need enough repetition with it to um, to be able to trust your own 
your your own instinct on it. Well, well now you're talking about repetition of intuition. Is there an intuition habit that you recommend? That's a good one. Yeah, I'm giving a long pause to this because I haven't ever thought of it that way. Um, but you know the number one that is lucky people, right? L lucky people are just people that are open to the world, right? Mm -hmm. Like there's a lot of people that, that believe that. Some of them explain it in a very spiritual way. Like certainly the book The Secret is along that yeah. way, right? Like I would have a hard time taking that book seriously as a reader. But on the other hand, I'm almost positive the advice actually pans out because the like just training yourself to be open however they convince you to go about that means that you're going to notice more opportunity and so there's a bunch of habits in Lyft that are about gratitude and I think are effectively about making you lucky so um, there's a really popular uh, write three good things about your day habit inside of Lyft um, there's some standard ones just be grateful even I think you know, give someone a compliment. Like anything that, that has you looking for good in the world, I think has the side effect of making you luckier. And I th kind of think that, you know, that's not a rational part of your life. You're not like rationally, well, this week I'm going to be lucky and next week I'm not going to care as much about being lucky. It, it is like those, those things come about um, unconsciously, but I think there's habits that that, that train them. It's true that a large percentage of what happens in your body is irrational because it's not conscious and it can only be rational when it's conscious. So your heart beats, but it's not rational that your heart beats. It just does. And someone jumps out and says, boo, and you get startled. It's not rational that you got startled. You just did. And all of those things, like you're attracted to women that look like a certain thing. Okay. That none of that's rational, but like we know that it's there. I spent a large part of my life as uh, an executive, like trying to only be rational and it, it actually doesn't work. So I've trained my intuition with a lot of different techniques. And I mean, if you want to get to the root of, yeah. of the secret, read like Louise Hay, which is like the most hippie, crazy stuff out there, you know, right. 15 minute miracle stuff. Like uh, you, you have to like open your mind so far, your brain falls out to read it and then put your brain back in when you're done because it, it really sounds like total hippie BS. But when you practice the steps without judging them as rational or irrational, accepting that 90% of what your body does is irrational anyway, I think it manufactures luck. Like, who, what can you say? Like, it, it seems to. Right. It, you know, you can almost do like the second degree analysis, which is rationally, if we're, we can, most people will admit that if they're motivated, they'll do better. So by that, if you just take that as a law, Anything that motivates a person is rationally good, no matter how metaphysical it is, right? And, you know, this is, I think, a trend that's going on in Silicon Valley is that you have a bunch of really, you know, overly rational people rediscovering the 60s for the purposes of performance, right? Like, you know, meditation, I think, is our fifth most popular habit inside of Lyft. I was wondering about that. I mean, like, Really? You know, and so I told my parents about this. I was like, you know, hey, hey, mom, I'm getting really into meditation. And she's like, oh, yeah, I did that. Right? Like, <laughs> like way, way back when. <laughs> but she's totally past it, right? And I was like, no, no, I think this is going to make me more productive at work. And she's like, what? <laughs> like, this, don't, that's not what we were meditating for. We were meditating to bring about world peace. And I was like, no, no, I think... I'll be more present. I'll be able to close bigger deals. I'll be, you know, more insightful in my meetings if I meditate, right? And then now that we've gotten a, a chance to meet uh, a lot of people, sort of meditators in the startup space, there's this weird thing that goes on, which is on the one hand, it is great for performance. Yeah. It, like it, it clears your mind, it gives you this training on how to be present in the moment just super hard with all of the distractions we have but it also brings about these kind of spiritual moments where uh and you know it's hard to i don't even think we're really prepared to talk about that you know i came back from uh from a retreat at esalen which is like 
the original human potential space. Like for 50 years, they've been on the cutting edge of the human potential movement. I mean, they basically invented this. Every big name in psychology has, has, oh, yeah. you know, their buildings are named after Maslow, and um, and it is, it's a little crunchy there. You wore your tie dyes, huh? Yeah. <laughs> And, you know, you, you swim, you know, you bathe naked in the hot tubs at night, right? Like, all this stuff is going on. But I was there with other tech entrepreneurs, and, you know, we were naked in the hot tubs yelling about venture capitalists. So we didn't, like, completely change our spots. Uh, but when I came back, you know, I had to explain where I was to the team, and I, I was like, okay, let me just preface everything, which is I'm still the same person. I love sports. I love rap music. I like I really want this company to succeed any way, you know, by any means necessary. But also I may be using words like transformational in the future. And uh and we're just going to have to deal with that dichotomy. There's two I'm having two kind of separate things and somehow in my mind they merge. Um and you know, I mean I think there's a lot of that going on right now. Uh I, I bring some of my bulletproof coaching clients through the 40 years of Zen style program where literally you spend seven days not just meditating like you would in Vipassana or something, but you're actually reminded 50 times a second at, at many different points on your head whether you're doing it right or not. So it, it, it's literally like meditation with rubber bumpers and alarms if you try and do it wrong. So it's very fast and yeah. it's it's not just transformational, but it's tumultuous. Like it is hard work to do 40 years of, of mental focus in a short period of time. And, you know, people throw up, people cry. Like, like it is as, you know, gut wrenching as anything I've ever done. Yeah. Um, more than like being pursued by bounty hunters across LA or something when I've done that too. Right. Oh, awesome. <laughs> so you're like, Oh, but when you do it and people come back from it, it yeah, it, it takes a little while to get sort of, you know, back, uh, back all the way to where you want to be. But you find that when you do that, your ability to focus and like the voices in your head are changed. And all of a sudden, yeah, you do talk about transformation and maybe you temporarily got a bit of a hippie vibe, but it doesn't matter because even with that, you're so much more productive and your just, your focus is, is unbelievable. Yeah. I love having access to that focus. Yeah. Because, right. you know, your day is crazy. It's like you have so many things going on. You're switching back and forth. And then just randomly, you're going to have some high pressure moment. You know, one of your employees is going to come and say, Hey, you know, Dave, we got to talk. And you're like, you know, you got to be there in that moment. You yeah. got to be able to summon it um, in that moment. And like meditation is, you know, these things are basically practice for that, for that skill. Yeah. And it gets worse too if it's your board members. You know, they're they're sitting there. They're you know they're what you know, the world's the sky's falling. The world's coming to an end. And you know you, you didn't hit your number or you hit your number over five percent. You were sandbagging and like what, whatever it is they're they're going to hit you with. You can react emotionally. You yeah. can you know just shut up and look angry, uh, or you can you can like you said you bring it. You, you turn it on and you're like all right. And the ability to bring it is a habit that you can form and is a habit that you can train. And when you train that to be able to bring it endlessly, as long as you want to, to bring it more than anyone else at the table and to still be bringing it when they're done, right? it's going to reflect in the relationships you have with people and it's going to reflect in your success. It just is. And I mean, that's what's so great about the current research and the behavior design right now is there's just a lot of people helping to uncover that everything that you want to achieve is trainable. So, look, that news is both good and bad, right? The good news is, hey, you can get there. The bad news is, hey, you're going to have to put in some work. And not only that, you've, you're either wild or you've already been trained in a way that you didn't consent to. Right. That's called growing up. Yeah. <laughs> right? Like, it's like the untrain. The, the whole first, especially seven years of life, is a set of trainings, most of which happen below the conscious level. So the voice in your head now is the voice in the head you heard when you were two. And you were trained that way. And if you don't like that training or you're not even aware of it, part of changing your habits is changing the training that underlies the habits. And I found that using biohacking technologies is the fastest way to do it because the feedback loop from the consciousness to the unconscious parts of the body 
it's too long. The, the conscious parts are slow. The unconscious parts are so fast that it, you know, you can do the same thing over and over and over and eventually you get through. But if you can find a way to rewrite those rules to sort of hack your way in, then suddenly habit change becomes much easier. And that's been a major focus of, of what I've done to myself and what I, I do when I work with, with people. I love that, right? So the competition, I mean, let's just assume everyone is going to put work in, but the competition is how, how can you find the most effective practice? And that, I mean, that's a lot of insider knowledge. Like, so I love that. What is this thing that you were putting on people's heads? What's it called? I, I have a whole bunch of different things, but there's the upgraded focus brain trainer. Five minutes of training on this thing teaches you. Actually, I won't even say you. It teaches your brain to put more blood in the front of itself when you want to pay attention. And your score on the TOVA test, which is you know, a quantitative test of your ability to pay attention, it goes up and your score will be higher later. Like it's stable. It, it gives you new skills to focus. So perfectly healthy, high performance people in five minutes of training a day for a month or two are like, oh my God, I can look at four screens and my focus is just there. So somehow you can magically learn to bring it or you can look at the score on the screen, see it change in real time. And the trick is your nervous system understands real time, but your conscious brain is always a third of a second lagging behind because you're so slow when you're being rational. So okay. train I'm the part of you that brings it. My mind is blown by this. Like this seems like the most important thing. Like it's like one of 10 biohacking technologies. Yeah, like we'll, we'll hook you up next time I'm in San Francisco. Like what? they're handmade for people. There's about 200 of these in existence. And what would what does one cost if you want to buy one? A thousand bucks, and you can share it with as many people as you want. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it, it's kind of a deal, right? Right. Now, you know, I think one thing you start to learn as a CEO, or maybe just as you get older, is kind of the value of money, right? And so, yeah. when you're young, I mean, shit, you can't afford anything, so it's got to be cheap no matter what. But then you start kind of really thinking about the trade-offs, and like, would I put a thousand dollars into like? Shit, I mean, I put almost $100,000 into graduating college, right? So absolutely, I'd put $100,000 and or $1,000 into something that helps me focus. Well, the, this 40 years of Zen stuff, a side effect that's been shown in a study is 12 IQ points that are stable a year later. So the first time I did it, literally, I had two weeks off between jobs. And I'm like, I never have time for this kind of stuff. I also said, well, I've been going without normal pay for quite a while now, like almost two years, you know, entrepreneur in residence and startup CEO or not CEO, startup, whatever, but very low pay living in, you know, Silicon Valley and areas. And I'm like, okay, I put it all on my discover card. I'm like, screw this noise. It's only $1,200 an IQ point. That's the best deal ever. And if I had to meditate for an hour a day for 40 years, like $15,000 divided by that, I'm like the hourly rates, 50 cents or something ridiculous. So I just literally was like, I'll pay it off over the next year. And I did. And it yeah. was a completely awesome thing. And it did more than I expected. And it, it was one of the many biohacking technologies that that really was worth the $300,000 I ended up investing in all these different things. Yeah. So like, when it comes down to it, though, you, you hit it on the head. And there's a whole reason we started talking about this stuff. Is like, what are the things you can do that give you the most bang for the buck? And if the bang is like nuclear level ginormous, then okay, you know, find a way and do it. And one of the most inspiring stories about that specific kind of training is you know, a waitress who saved up tips for three years, did it, and like, I'm pretty sure she's not a waitress anymore, right? Like, like it can, you can make it happen if, if you need to. And honestly, some of these things are dirt cheap. And one of my missions with the Bulletproof Executive is to raise awareness of the technologies to stimulate demand, which will increase supply and drop the cost. Because I want kids in high school, every single one of them to go through this. Oh, you want to learn how to pay attention? Instead of giving you detention when you don't pay attention, you know how much time I spent in detention despite the fact that I was number two, my GPA was number two in the whole school? Right. I was in detention all the time because I was sleeping all the time because it was boring, right? It wasn't a lack of ability to pay attention. My brain was not trained and no one taught me how to pay attention. So what if we just had a little computer teach kids to pay attention and then we schooled them? And that's why I biohack my kids. My three-year-old does breathing exercises hooked up to an iPhone measuring his heart rate variability, and he can bring it. And he's three. Yeah. yeah. Now, like half of school should be soft skills. Yeah. You know? And th I mean, even the phrase is wrong. But like, these are the most important things. And you get so much out of, I don't even know. I mean, I'm, I look back at school all the time, and I don't understand what I was doing in middle school. Like, why, why did school exist? Because I didn't, don't remember learning anything. 
I played basketball at recess. But other than that, nothing. And I think, you know, if, if we had just worked on how to focus and, man, that's like that would have paid off so much better. Yeah, I, I wish that they had taught me something like that. I, I learned a lot about how to, like, you know, throw a good punch, yeah. stuff like that. It depends on how, how rough your school was. But honestly, the stuff that I see now and yeah. some of the, the changes in the education system that are happening are, are not positive. But then you see these, like, community movements uh, one of my friends in Silicon Valley is running a group where they hire a superbly talented teacher for like 50 bucks an hour or something. And they have five families and each throws in 10 bucks an hour, cheaper than a nanny. And all of a sudden now you have this a five person class, which is every teacher's dream. And a teacher is making twice what the public schools pay. Like right. that sort of thing has to happen more. And honestly, those are the ones who are going to be at the forefront of biohacking their kids because they'll realize, wow, if I train the kids to pay attention, they'll be happier. And that's really what it comes down to. You, you want happy kids who can play and pay attention and be focused. And those grow up into the most successful, amazing entrepreneurs. Yeah, no, exactly. Like you, if you could do that, you basically remove half of the angst of growing up. Yeah. Like, you know, half of that, there's one half of angst about, for me, girls, absolutely. I, I think that's, you might not be alone there. <laughs> yeah. Right. Anyone and for up? girls, it's boys, right? <laughs> um, right. For girls, it's boys and also other girls. Oh, fair point. Uh, right. But... But the, the other was, I'm lazy. Everyone's telling me I'm lazy and I need to work harder at school. And it's like, uh, but I don't want to work harder at school. It sucks. It's boring, right? It's a virtue. A person who's not lazy will meditate the same way for 50 years. A lazy person will say, hurry, meditate faster. That's me. Hands up. Like, yeah, for sure. You should yeah. be proud of that. Right. When I was first a programmer, I was a Perl programmer. And that's actually one of, like, they start out when they teach you Perl. They say, number one virtue of Perl, laziness. Like we try, if you're lazy, you're gonna like this language, and I mean they're right. Productive people are, have laziness as a virtue. The the whole notion of cloud computing getting off track a little bit is sure. it, so. I'm, I'm originally an IT guy, systems administrator, helped to create some of the modern automation stuff around cloud that that became modern cloud. And the reason I did it, I was really lazy, and I wanted to automate my job away, and then I just wanted to like read cool you know, use net posts or something. Well, my job was happening by itself. Like that is what became cloud computing. It wasn't, you know, it was tens of thousands of IT guys, but all, all of us were like, could we get rid of the boring? And that's lazy. It's, it's as a virtue, it's lazy. I mean, having watched sysadmins through the ages, I got to say what looks like the shittiest part of the job is not just being woken up in the middle of the night, but being woken up and having to drive to a freaking data center. Yep. And like, you know, get in there and actually like, you know, hit on some servers. Like, I mean, it must be so great for quality of life. You know, essentially, not have, they don't have to work as hard because these yep. things are all managed by someone else. Although technically, Amazon must have some people that. No, even they've managed to get away around it. No, what what you do there is you just leave the broken servers in the racks. Who cares? And you just move the workload. Yep. The ultimate lazy solution when you think about it. Right. Yeah. All right. All right, we're we're coming up towards the end of the podcast, but I wanted to ask you one thing because you've got an interesting data set, and we talk about quantified self. We talk about data a lot. You can tell me what the most popular habit is on Lyft, which is an amazing data point. What is the most popular habit? I don't know. It's exercise, which is kind of a generalized version of a group of habits. Okay, but yeah, with is there more? to that question because I have a couple of interesting things to say about it. I do want to know more and I want to know what n the number two one is as well but so first just tell me the interesting stuff that's what this is all about. Um, so the top five I'll just read right here is exercise, drink more water, read, floss, meditate. So it, Floss is in the top five? Well so let's... That's there, hilarious. There's a bunch of good anecdotes here. Floss is a really interesting one because it ties back to our earlier conversation about decision fatigue. Like here, the early adopters of Lyft are these incredibly successful, ambitious people, and they're the ones that made Floss one of the top ones. And if you think about it, an ambitious person is just going to wear down their entire decision-making budget throughout the day, decide to go to bed, and be out of decisions. So it's flossing these things, these end-of-day routines, are actually what they're most at risk for, for missing. Um, but the other thing that really stood out to me as I went through our 
uh, through our list is is there's almost like a Maslow's hierarchy of goals here where we want to be fit and healthy and feel good physically. Then we start to be ambitious about our careers and we want to be productive. Then we start to realize like, oh, hey, I'm not the only person that lives in this house. I've got a wife like and a family. I want to be home for dinner with my kids. I want to make sure I tell her. I, like, There's a very active tell my wife I love her habit on side of Lyft, inside of Lyft. And then once you get there, then you're ready to be this self-actualized person that's giving back to uh, to the community. So there's things like, uh, you know, um, talk to a stranger is a really popular one. Which, I mean, it's a if you if you think about it, we're so transactional with the strangers in our lives. And if we just make eye contact with them and say, "How was your day?" and treat them like an actual human. There's a, a random act of kindness, you know. Like you start to get at people's generosity at that point. It's kind of funny. One of the reasons I moved to Vancouver Island, I live in a relatively small town. Is that if I go to the drugstore, the cashier is going to look at me and say, "How are you doing?" And you know what? She actually looks at me, and and if I said I was just dismembered by a bunny, she would yeah. go, "What?" And if I said that in San Francisco, the vast majority of the time, the person would say, here's your change. Like, they just don't hear, they don't care, and it's so transactional. And I find there's very little transactional, or maybe not enough, so I'm kind of balanced, because I, you know, I'm on airplanes a lot, too, where it's highly transactional. But it's so amazing what happens when you build that habit. So I, I'm impressed to see that that's on Lyft. Yeah. Um, well, we're, we're about out of time, but there's a question that I've made a habit of. There, I tied it in. All right. Every guest on the show answers the question. Based on your entire life experience, what are the top three most important things people can do to be higher performance, just to kick more ass? It doesn't have to be any particular domain, just what you've learned as a CEO, as a human being. Number one, know yourself. Like I think perform the number one thing for performance and myself at least is to be doing things that are coherent with who I am. Right. And so when we touched on it earlier, like some people will give you advice that's made for them but not made for you and so Lyft for example I care about impact I don't care that much about being rich and so Lyft is a hundred percent about what is the most impactful way I could spend my time uh, performance uh, this is performance as a CEO it, it, just performance as a human being like the things that are most important people want to kick more ass you might want to kick more ass at being a dad or you might want to kick more ass at being a CEO who knows or, or a mom for that matter this is not a boys only show by a long shot 40% of our audience is women all right, high, high 40%. <laughs> um, three. Uh, I mean, the number two is exercise. Man, like, and, but I think it's not really exercise, it's selfishness, right? Like when you talk to people that aren't exercising, what they tell you is that they're too generous with their time. They say like, you know, by the time I've taken care of my family and my coworkers and my job, I didn't have time to exercise. And like exercise is almost that, you know, canary in the coal mine of are you putting enough time into your own health that you will be effective in the long run? Um, and the number three, gratefulness. So I have two gratefulness habits. Every night before we go to bed, my partner Sarah and I tell each other two good things. And we've been doing this for almost a decade now. And it started when she was in grad school and, and working full time. And I was starting my first company, and we had no money, and we were completely stressed. And so we said, "Well, is our life are, are our lives that bad? Let's at, let's at least try and find something good from every day." And then I do a similar thing at the end of every year. I try and pick out 52 highlights from the year, and I look back on each year, and I'm like, "Wow, I thought it was a really stressful." year based on you know working really hard but then when I look at the list of 52 good things it just changes my whole outlook and reminds me um, really how just how great my life is wonderful Tony thanks a ton for being on the show I really appreciate those tell me the URL for Lyft so that all of our listeners can figure out how to find you and look at your stuff to build some healthy habits yes um, please go to uh, lift.do l-i-f-t dot d-o and uh, it should be pretty straightforward. Everyone can get started pretty quickly. Awesome. Have a right. cool evening. Thanks, man. You too. Appreciate it. 
Yeah, I think uh, the top three things I'm gonna say just is you know drink drink more coffee. <laughs> I love you, man. Oh, sorry. <laughs> drink drink wine, and drink scotch. Those are my those are my three things. <laughs> I have not heard those ones before. See the head of foam that's formed on it? This is similar to what you get with a latte. There are actually little bubbles still coming to the surface, just like a freshly steamed latte.